That's uh, my great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Bob Roberts to us tonight. I first, um, uh, Bob reminded me actually, we met first of all about 10 years ago, and I'd forgotten actually where we were when we did that, but actually it was with Toppy, I think, in London, wasn't it? We first met. And uh, I've been very blessed to hear Bob a few times in various New Frontiers settings, that Terry is particularly. Uh, Terry and Bob are very good friends, and Terry has brought Bob amongst us in a number of contexts, and I've been personally very impacted by him. Uh, and I really felt God put on my heart when we were thinking about this conference and who to invite to, to uh, kind of bring some fresh stimulus to us. Uh, I just felt very clearly um, Bob's name brought to me by the Lord, so we're very thankful that providentially that's worked out. I know you're going to be very, very blessed, and I trust, Bob, you'll feel very at home and welcome amongst us. It really, we really are so thankful that you've made the time to be here with us in your, in your busy schedule. So let's welcome Bob as he comes and speaks to us this evening. It's an honor to be with you. I'm excited as I listen to what God is doing in you and through you. And your conference the past couple of days, what you've experienced, it's always, I don't know, the, the way I feel about movements, I'm, I'm a part of one called Global Net. There's something about the family. There's something about how God moves and works and speaks, and that's what I want to hear from. And so I also understand being an outsider to your movement, uh, and, and I thank you, Mike, so much for what you said, because... The reality is I don't want to say anything that would be disruptive to your movement or wouldn't be in line with what God is saying you, saying to you as well, because I'm grateful for what God's doing with New Frontiers. I believe in this movement. I love Terry Virgo. He's had a huge impact on my life personally, and David Devinish, and New Frontiers. And, and so it's an honor to be with you, Mike, tonight. Thank you for inviting me. And so uh, I'm just going to share with you uh, what God has put on my heart, and I hope that clock works. It says 20.04. Does that work back there, Mike? I want to make sure it does because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to go. Uh, they told me tonight I was supposed to speak 20 minutes, and I did not want to go above that. So I'm, I'm kidding you. I'm, te <laughs> I'm, te I'm teasing you. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you about something, and, and I just want you to do two things right now, even before I begin. We're going to go Korean style on everybody. So would you just stretch your hands towards me? Pray for my throat. I got throat issues. Got another two months of this. It's doing better, even since I was with you guys a couple of weeks ago. But pray for my throat. Pray for my mind. Pray that I'll say exactly what God wants me to say. No more, no less. Would you do that? Come on, just whisper prayers over me right now. So, Holy Spirit, you are here, you are moving, and you are at work already. And, and we come to you as leaders, not merely to be encouraged, that's important, not merely to be blessed, that's important, not even to, to hear another sermon. God, we've heard tons of sermons in our lives. We need a word from you. We need direction. Things are broken. And God, you are speaking and you're moving and you're working. So Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence and we just pray that we're in flow with you just to experience what you would do here is my prayer in your name. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight about something extremely important. I really believe that we're on the verge of a great revival like we've never seen. I really do. Uh, I've studied revivals, I've studied movements, and one of the things that's interesting, there have been specific movements and revivals in countries, and sometimes in even parts of continents, but there has never been a worldwide revival. And I think many of you that are younger here are going to live to see it, I really do. Some of us that are older, maybe we'll get to see it, I don't know. But I really believe that we're going to see a move of God. And one of the reasons I believe that is I'm, I'm seeing it in my country right now. I'm seeing it at university campuses. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it take place in secular venues. 
I'm not seeing it take place in the church. But it's starting to happen. And, and another reason I believe it's going to happen is because when the church is so broken and is so out of control that non-believers look at us and we've lost all credibility because we're not living up to the standard of holiness as believers that they know should be basic. They know we're broke. We know we're broke. When they see this, it's in those instances that people get desperate for God and revival comes. So when I see things moving in such a negative direction, there's one sense in which my heart is broken. When I see the things take place with the church in America, how it's been politicized and, 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 and how in so many ways we've, we've lost our testimony and we've equated Christianity with Americana, my heart is broken because there is this kingdom that transcends all nations. I, I just want to tell you, I was raised believing this but I no longer believe in the concept of a Christian nation. It's too small a thing for God. I can't find anywhere in the scripture where it says we're to make Christian nations. I do find where there should be Christians in every nation that are impacting that nation for the good. We belong to something beyond a nation it's called a kingdom, the kingdom of God. And any loyalties, any priorities, any distractions, any institutions or entities less than the kingdom of God is idolatry for us as followers of Jesus. It's because we believe in the kingdom of God that I stand here as a guy from America speaking to you guys in England and our hearts are knit together because of Jesus Christ. I believe we're at a point of significant revival and it's not going to happen because some guy ushers it in in a worship service. I'm convinced it's going to happen in the public square in public places. No doubt in my mind about that. I also believe that the greatest obstacle to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world is the church. The great commission, the thing that we are most passionate about, the world that we live in is a radically different world. And in so many ways, it's not the message or the theology that needs to change, but how we engage the world. We've got to get all the way back to the New Testament. See, we're big about doing church stuff, church industry, church planting, Oh, no, he doesn't believe in church planting. Yeah, I've helped start over 400 churches. I believe in church planting. But it's not the industry of our faith as much as it is the people of the faith and how they engage the broader public square that it's going to take to see a movement of God. But we don't know how to do that. That's why we can have great worship services and the world is going to hell. The question for a pastor, a church leader, is not, how's my church? It's, how's my city? And if we understand that, it changes how we do church because no longer am I rating on a scale of one to 10. How was the music? How was the sermon? How was the offering? How many baptisms did we have? Was everybody on key when they sang? Were the ushers in place? Did the classes take place? There is something far bigger 
than church industry that we are being called to. The two most significant things that I believe we're going to see take place are how we engage the world, what some people would call missiology, and the next great move of God. And I believe with all my heart, there's not another group like New Frontiers. More than any other group, perhaps in the world, you have a shot at seeing God do something that very few people do. What I'm sharing with you may sound very different from what you're used to hearing it, but Terry and David have had me all over the world with them at different places. And what I'm sharing with you is the same thing I share with the global church in different countries as I go around the world and I teach and I mobilize and I release. But as we do that, here's what you've got to understand. Everything that I'm going to share with you rises and falls on your understanding of the concept of the kingdom of God. I knew the gospel of salvation. I'm a Baptist. I mean, we're going to get them saved and dunk them, come hell or high water. <laughs> we'll bribe you with pizza, feed you. We'll do whatever it takes to get you to pray that sinner's prayer. By the way, I don't believe in that anymore. I am reformed, so I can't save anybody. We don't have to pimp the gospel to see people come to Jesus. The gospel is powerful enough in and of itself to do its work in order to draw somebody. As a matter of fact, if we draw them to Jesus, we're not going to keep them. But when the Spirit draws them, so I think you guys believe in the Holy Spirit, if I'm not mistaken. So the reality is you can't save them because it's a sovereign God who does that. Furthermore, it's the Spirit that draws them. We have a little saying at Northwood, serve not to convert. Serve because you've been converted. The measure of the Good Samaritan was that he helped somebody that had no ability to help him back. I want everybody to accept Christ. I speak in more mosques than I do church. I've spoken some of the largest mosques in the world on a regular basis. 80% of my time, I'm with non-Christians, all right? But I want you to understand something that's very important. It's more than just getting people saved. When I go in those mosques, I'll tell them, I'd love to baptize every single one of you. And they just start laughing. I got on the plane in uh, Dallas as I was coming here last night. And there's one of the most famous imams in the world is based there in Dallas. And he's a 52-year-old guy. He's coming over here to speak to several hundred Muslims. So we died laughing. He's a close friend of mine. You're speaking to Muslims. I'm speaking to Christians. We ought to swap pulpits and see if people will figure out the difference. <laughs> but literally, he had me come to his mosque. And I spoke about a year ago. This thing's had hundreds of thousands of hits. And literally for 30 minutes, I sat inside his mosque and I explained the plan of salvation and what we believe about Jesus to hundreds of men. At his invitation. And he would stop me and say, we don't believe that. We don't believe that. I, said, I, know, I know you don't believe that, but that's what we believe. And we talked about Jesus and we talked about all this stuff. Tell him all the time I want to baptize. As a matter of fact, I told him that night, I was talking, there were hundreds of them in there. And so me and, and, and Yasser are sitting in front of them in, in, a, in a couple of big stools. And I made a statement. I said, how many of y'all would love for me to do the Shahada tonight? Man, you got to understand, they're very formal in a mosque. Everybody's hands went up and they started saying, yes, yes, Pastor Bob, yes, this is wonderful. Do the Shahada. That's how you become a Muslim. You, you say something three times in a row. And so I said, you know how excited y'all feel right now? They said, yes. That's how excited I would feel if every single one of you would come to Jesus. And they just died laughing. Guys, the world is waiting for us. Be bold. You don't have to be shy, scared, sneak in, sneak out. Be a real person who loves Jesus. Bring value to the whole of society, and the whole world will invite you there. I go to countries nobody else gets to go to that, that are called preachers, and I hang out with people that 
Very few people get to hang out with. And people say, did you share the gospel? Well, what do you think we talked about? The whole time. God's given me massive access to people all over the world in hell holes and in palaces and in kingdoms and places that preachers aren't supposed to go. And, and I hate to tell you this, pastors, but it's not because they've been downloading my sermons. It's because I became friends with these people. And the reason I became friends with them, I went in to serve them. And I served them because I was converted. And I served them because Luke 9, 23 rocked my world when I began to understand it. You know it. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself daily, take up his cross and follow me. And so we take that. We got to be willing to die like Jesus on the cross. And we, every day we got to die to ourselves. Put him first, right? Right. But when the apostles heard that, that's not what they heard. Luke 9, they didn't realize Jesus was going to go to a cross and die. What they heard was, what is he talking about? Going to a cross, just giving it your all. Be willing to have the worst form of death that there is, I guess. But Jesus knew they would remember that when he was gone. And it is. It's in at least three of the synoptic gospels. It's in the three synoptic gospels. Here's what he was saying. You got to be willing to pick up your cross, take your cross, follow me, whatever the price, even give your life for people, listen to this, that are going to reject me. Who do you love enough to share the gospel with, to give your life for, that even if they say no, you're still going to give them your all and your life? Who do you love that much? I mean, we all love them enough that somebody got saved and we can tell a big story. But do you love like Jesus who died for the sins of the world and yet the world has not accepted him? So what does this ministry look like? What, is, what does it look like? And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about a concept called domains. But you've got to understand everything I just shared with you about the kingdom, about the world, and about the Spirit of God, of how it moves. So get your Bibles, and I want you to turn with me to Colossians 1, 15 through 20. And I want you to look at what it says. And, and I wish we had time. Some scholars say that, you know, it's hard to believe that Paul wrote Colossians because it is so deep, and it's so refined, and there's such a mature theological understanding. Well, that doesn't make sense to me at all. Paul was not Jesus. Paul was not God. Paul was learning just like we learn. So when I read Colossians, what I see is not something that's different, but I see the growth of the Apostle Paul in his understanding and his, how the Holy Spirit has spoke to him. And previously, he's talked about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We see the Trinity in Colossians 1. And so starting in verse 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Guys, let me just say one of the key theological concepts. If you want to work with Jews, if you want to work with Muslims, Buddhists, and frankly, if you want to work with Christians, they don't know it that well either, is an understanding of the Trinity. The Trinity is not a theological concept. It is our definition of God. Tragically, we lead people to faith in Christ and try to then explain to them and help them understand the Trinity. That's problematic. That's our definition of God. Share the gospel in such a way that you're explaining the Trinity the whole time you're sharing. The firstborn of all creation. I mean, that's God. For by him, all things. Now, I'm used to all nations. And I'm used to all people. But that says all things. Well, he's talking about people too, right? That's probably what he means. We're created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. What does he mean? Things God created that are invisible. What's he talking about? What about love? What about mercy? 
What about compassions? What about patience? What about the characteristics of the Spirit? What about the fruits of the Spirit? Do you understand? God's created a lot of things that we experience, but there is not physical substance to them. Whether thrones or dominions, rulers, authorities, all things. Go back and look. Thrones, power and authority. Dominions, authority. In other words, how things are put together in society. All things were created through him and for him. So what he's doing, he's taking the creation from the physical world now to things that we don't see and also to things of infrastructures in society. He is before all things and in him. Look look at this, Jesus. In him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. Whoa, let's stop right there. He's not said anything about the church. He's talked about in the first 14 verses, the glory of God, the majesty of who God is. And now he's talking about principalities, authorities. He's talking about all things, infrastructures, things that are put together. And the church, right in the middle of that, he says the church. Why does he do that? He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So all the way back to the creation, to the cross, By the way, guys, let me make something very clear for you. The kingdom of God did not start when Jesus came as a baby. The kingdom of God started when God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus inaugurated it when he came. Israel was a picture of what a physical kingdom looked like when she followed God. And what a physical kingdom looked like when she rejected God. Israel was to show the truth, the light, who God was. That's why the Great Commission is not merely in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. That they be a light to the nations. I always give rabbis a hard time with them when they get upset about me trying to convert everybody. And and the Great Commission we've got, I remind them, hey, it started with you guys. I mean, the Great Commission is all throughout. I've written a whole chapter in a book I wrote about the Great Commission all throughout. What Jesus did was he fulfilled it. Amen? Come on, are y'all Pentecostals or not? He fulfilled it. Amen? Amen? Now, this is critical to understand because a lot of us have the idea, some people have the idea, the Old Testament was God's plan A, the New Testament, God's plan B. no. God's plan A has been at work the whole time. The Old Testament was merely showing where we were and what we needed. That's why the Messiah was prophesied. Amen? That's why the fifth gospel, Isaiah, was present. Amen? Because it's telling us we need a sacrifice. We don't just need the lion. We need a lamb. So it's getting us ready. So what happens when we come to the New Testament? God doesn't spit the Jews out of his mouth. He just grafts us in. And if a Jew wants to reject him, he can reject him. But Jews follow Jesus every single day. Amen? They've accepted Christ just like anybody else that's accepted him as Savior and Lord. Now, there's some crazy American evangelical preachers that say, well, we accept Jesus, but if the Jews just follow the law, they can get in. They hadn't read the New Testament. Jesus was a Jew. He came to his his own first. Are you with me? Because he wants Jews to accept him just like he wants crazy Gentiles to accept him. (laughs) Amen? Amen? And so what we see is no longer... The destruction of Israel, what we see is we're all brought into Israel because the Messiah has come. And now it's not one nation, it's every nation. That means all of us. I mean, you ought to be excited about that. And and, and that's why I freak out over Christians today that want to go back and perform all the old ceremonies of the Old Testament and 
and, and the Jews have to do this and they have to do that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus fulfilled all that stuff. You got a problem with that? Go read the book of Galatians. Should you love the Jews? Yes. Does God love the Jews more than you? I hope not. There's all kind of passages in the Bible that says God's no respecter of persons. Why is this important? It's important because now what happens, it's not one nation, it's all nations. And so the next question is, why is the church involved in this? And he's going to answer that. Firstborn from the dead, that in everything, he might be preeminent. That's heavy duty. In everything, he is first. Why is the church there? We're there to be salt and light so that he is preeminent, preeminent in the world. That's our mission, the mission of Jesus. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, this is profound. Because literally what he's saying is the atonement, atoned not just for sin, but for everything that was broken. Is healing in the atonement? Yeah. And everything else. Now, if this is true, how do we do ministry? And what are the implications? I went to Fuller to get my doctorate because in the 90s, that was the place where you wanted to study missions. And my wife and I always wanted to be missionaries. And her mom was killed in a car wreck. With, they were bringing home a little baby and a and, uh, newborn baby, Nikki's little sister. And a drunk hit him head on and killed the baby, killed her mother. And then three years later, she's in another car accident. This one kills her other sister and crushes her bones where they'd have to have all these surgeries her whole life. And so we tried three times, but they rejected us all three times because my tribe, and I understand, they didn't want to have to uh, pay all the hospital costs if we were to have to have those. But you know, guys, God is sovereign. Amen. And I think what God does, he made us both want to be missionaries, but didn't allow us to be appointed traditional missionaries because he was going to make this passage come alive. A lot of times we read the Bible and we read it, but we don't see it. We have to experience it. And so my wife and I wanted to be missionaries. And so we were broken hearted, but God had another plan. And we were praying at our church because one day I had a profound realization and I was reading the Great Commission and it hit me that the Great Commission was given to everybody. And I thought, it was like the Holy Spirit was literally saying to me, Bob, the church is the missionary. And I thought, wait, 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 because I always thought, no, the missionary was somebody like me that went to seminary, got a couple of degrees, picked a place in the world to go work, and I'm the missionary. No, that's, that's not how they thought of it. You know, the word missionary wasn't even used. Don't you find it interesting that all the disciples went to the ends of the earth? You do realize that, uh, except, except for uh, one who stayed in Jerusalem. Yeah, they all went to the ends of the earth. I've studied their biographies and what they do. So they all go. Now, why is that? Did God call them all to be missionaries? Have you ever read Acts 13? It, it doesn't say God called them to be missionaries. It said he set them apart. Now, now why is this important? Because we've shut down the missionary force to a handful of people when God intended all of us to be missionaries. But how do you do that? You do it the same way they did in the New Testament. By the way, do y'all know how the first church was started? Anybody know the first outside of Jerusalem, how the very first church was started? Two business guys. They hadn't been to seminary, hadn't been to train. But in Antioch, these two guys that are on the run, facing persecution like everybody else, they've left Jerusalem, they've been places, they wind up meeting up in Antioch, they start a church, it explodes. And so they send somebody back to Jerusalem 
tell about what's going on. And what's the response of the apostles? This is wonderful. We are so excited. It's who are these people? What have they done? What's going on? Furthermore, they were reaching Gentiles. Who told them they could do that? I mean, they are breaking all the rules. But look at what happens. They go back to them. They work with them. <coughs> and the result is that church takes off. Now, was it two missionaries that went and did it? I know I'm belaboring the point, And I also believe God calls specific people to go to specific places. All right? I'm just saying the other 698 of you, God's called you too. That's all I'm saying. I mean, you can send your money, you can pray for other people, but you can't pay somebody to fulfill what God called you to do. And as Spurgeon, a great Baptist from England said, you're either a missionary or an imposter. The only question is, are you a good missionary or are you a bad missionary? And here's what's happened. Over time, the church has grabbed it all, put it together, industrialized what we've done. And so we show up in countries to do church work. And when they see the condition of the American church and the corruption and the bad things that have happened sometimes around the world because of Americans, not Englanders, you guys did it right. I mean, you just colonized most of the world, you did. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> All I'm saying is there are ways to change the world that you've not begun to imagine. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And here's what happened. So we're praying, God, where do you want us to go? I mean, because God hit me with that. So I stood up at church one Sunday and I said, how many of you ever felt like being missionaries? And about a fourth to a third of the people raised their hand. It freaked me out. How could that many people feel called? But I began to think, what if God called them, but we don't know how to do missions? What if we're not thinking about this right? And so we begin to pray. What does a missionary do? They pick one spot. So I thought instead of bebopping all over the world, going, we're going to go to this country this year, that year, what would it look like if a church focused on a spot? And that's where it was going to stay until there was radical transformation. Long term. And so I had this guy who was an atheist that I'd led to faith in Christ. And he was a helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War, shot down three times, survived all three times. And he came back, wanted to be a doctor, became a very successful surgeon, but was an atheist. And so he said, let's do Vietnam. And you know, when you go to seminary, they teach you important things. Like when you want to say no, how to sound spiritual and not get in trouble. <laughs> And so he said, how about Vietnam? I just graduated from Fuller. That was called a closed country. My dad pastored near an Air Force base and buried a lot of soldiers. Every Sunday afternoon after church, my mom would have all these flyboys near the Air Force base come into our home. Many of them died and didn't make it. It devastated my little brother and I. Sometimes I wonder if that's why my parents didn't stay so long at that church because it was hard on me and my little brother. We looked up to those guys. When they weren't coming back, it broke our heart. And so I said, Bob, Bob Pro, he was the doctor. Let's just pray about it. <laughs> Amen. Men, let me tell you something. If your wife is wanting you to do something and you don't want to do it, just say, baby, we're going to pray about it. <laughs> I'm just waiting for a word from the Lord. Let's just keep praying. That's been three years ago. Honey, I don't want to rush the Lord. <laughs> Let's keep praying about it. You know, God is a miracle working God. That's why I like you guys. You're reformed and you're charismatic. That's important. People who are reformed and not charismatic are mean. If you're going to be reformed, you need the Holy Spirit. Amen? <coughs> Come on. Some of you look at me and you're scaring me. And people who have the Holy Spirit and are not reformed, they're just nuts. I mean, they're just crazy. I mean, they believe all kind of goofy stuff. So you need both. So God is sovereign, but he's also miracle working. The next week I got a call. <coughs> we were going to Cambodia because the church was legal. And so they had just been made legal. 
So they wanted me to speak. And so I was going to go speak at their event. But what made me go was two things. Number one, they were paying my way. Nothing moves in the way of the Lord like paying your way. You know God's in it. Amen. And the other thing was they were going to stop in Vietnam, in Hanoi. And so I don't have time to tell you this story, but uh, they didn't stop in Hanoi like they were going to because of sensitivities. This was in the uh, mid-90s, and we didn't yet have relationships with Vietnam. And, uh, but I did. I went by myself, and I didn't know if I was going to make it out once I got there, but I'm here today, so I did get out. But, it, but God broke my heart when I went to Hanoi, and I knew this is, this is where we've got to be. Bob's right. We've got to go here. So we're praying, and we're doing all those things, you know, Christians try to do in closed country, dine and dash evangelism, but I can't get my members mobilized. So I'm going, what do we do? And I'm working with this guy who did underground stuff and, you know, drop tracks here, there, whatever, all this kind of stuff, try to figure out how to do something and really not being effective, but you, you know, you need to do something. All right. And so we're trying to help him as best we can. And one Sunday, well, let me back up. Uh, well, yeah, it was on a Sunday. I got cornered by some church members who knew we were praying for Vietnam, and they said, hey, we've got an exchange student coming from Hanoi. And this was in like 97, 98, something like that. And they just passed a law that exchange students could come to America. And I didn't pay any attention to what they said until the kids showed up. And their dad, one of the top leaders in the country. And so it really upset me. I thought, you know what? We're trying to work in Vietnam. This kid's going to be problematic. How do we deal with this? Tried to get him to go to one of, we started a lot of churches. Tried to get him to go to one of our other churches, but they wouldn't do it. So I said, look, on some Sundays, they just can't be here. So, because we've got to raise money, we've got to talk about it, and I don't want to have a problem. And so one Sunday morning after about three or four months, I kept my distance because I didn't know how to even relate to that, that young person. One Sunday morning, I'm on the left side of our chapel, and we're worshiping, and everybody's hands are raised. And I just glance over to the right side of the chapel, and there's that kid. And their hands are lifted up, and they are sobbing. And I, oh, my word. That kid's going to accept Christ. And I would have been the biggest obstacle. And my next thought was, that kid's going to accept Christ, and that guy I'm working with in Vietnam is going to kill me because this ain't going to fly. That's going to get in the way of work with my mission work in Vietnam and his mission work. They can't get saved. That's going to mess it all up. <laughs> and it conflicted me because of the, oh, my word. This is what we want to see happen, but if this person, this is problem, what do we do? And so it's a beautiful story how they accepted Christ, but they accepted Christ on their own. And so they came with their host family one Wednesday night, wanted to be baptized. I explained I couldn't, and the host family did too, because of the, the, uh, the program she came under, you, you couldn't. And so we explained that. She went over to dial something on my phone. I wasn't paying attention. Handed me the phone, and it was her dad. That's not how you want to meet a top leader from, from another country. And so she read where early Christians got baptized at Easter. Wanted to be baptized Easter Sunday. So hands me the phone, and he invites me to Vietnam to sit down and talk to him about the decision his daughter's made. Uh, this is bad. This is bad. This is really bad. Well, yes, sir, I'll... Would you come and talk to me? Yes, sir, I'll come. So I agree to come. And so I go, they pick me up in this black limo, and I'm from East Texas. There's only two reasons why you ought to believe in God. The Bible says so, and I feel him in my heart. Amen? When I was a seminary student, I slept through philosophical, philosophical apologetics. But I get in the car with this man. He's highly educated, and he says, Bob, you've got a doctor's degree. Now, he knew that. I didn't tell him. He said, you've got a doctor's degree. Why would any intelligent man believe in God? You know how the Bible says the Holy Spirit gives you recall? 
All of a sudden, I heard Yandel Woodfin, all those lectures he gave. I said, well, sir, there are seven philosophical reasons why we believe God exists apart from the Bible. And there are five philosophical reasons if God does exist, why, he's, why it's one. And monotheism is right. And if it's monotheism, then really there are four philosophical reasons why it has to be Christianity over against Judaism or Islam or there is no hope. He said, Bob, this is brilliant. I've never heard this before in my life. And I'm going, I haven't either. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Saved my life right now. And so he says, uh, he began to ask me questions. And so all we did was talk about Jesus. Well, he calls me after I get dropped off. He said, hey, I want you to meet with some of my friends tonight. I want you to tell them what you told me. Would you do that? And I said, okay. I was exhausted. T took 24 hours to get there, put on my suit, met with them, went through the same thing, room about 15 or 20 of them, seven, five, four reasons. And, and they said, this is incredible. We've never heard this before. We have problems with Christians here, but we've never had a chance to talk to a Christian like you. Would you bring some Bibles and start meeting with us? I said, oh, I can't do that. They said, why? I said, well, the government won't let me. And one of them looked at me and said, Bob, we are the government. <laughs> and I'd never met with world leaders, nothing. And this is a country that our country had bad relationships with. I'm scared to death. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, okay, well, what do we do? And then all of a sudden, one of them said, he was with the Ministry of Education. He said, you know, we need 6,000 schools. Would you be willing to help us with those schools? And the next one said, well, hey, if you're going to help with schools, we need clinics. Would you be willing to help with the clinics? And all of a sudden, a little light went off in my mind. I hadn't read Kuiper about spheres. I didn't know what that was. But I did understand jobs. And on the way back from Vietnam to the U.S., all I did was categorize people based on their jobs. And I thought, here's what we do. And here's what else I discovered. One of the top 10 countries in the world that persecutes Christians the most, it was those people that were persecuting the Christians that were asking me the questions about who is Jesus? Why do you believe in him? That's who I was talking to about Jesus. I mean, it's just, it's just wrecking all my missiology that I've spent four years at Fuller Seminary getting. Instead of going through the back door or the side door, I'm going straight in through the front door. And the next thing I know, we've wound up having 160 exchange students from Vietnam. And that story was repeated many, 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 many times. I ain't going to tell you how many. Just a whole lot of times. I'm from Texas. We do everything big. Use your imagination. <laughs> and so they needed help with special ed because they passed a law. The special ed kids had to be streamlined but they had no curriculum. My wife's a special ed teacher. We had all these special ed teachers in our school. Guess who helped write all their special ed curriculum? Guess who helped Ford get PhDs? By the way, we have a whole office now in Vietnam. We have one of the largest NGOs there. And it's staffed by not a single white person like me. They're all North Vietnamese. God doesn't need me to do his work if I'm a leader. He needs me to raise up others as well to do his work. And by the way, a Vietnamese is going to be far more effective sharing the gospel and discipling somebody than a big old white guy like me who likes fried chicken and doesn't like pho or other food that they have. Do you get it? There's no cultural adaptation. So what's happening is it's messing with my mind. What do I do with this? How do I work it out? And so bottom line, we begin to work on all that. The next thing I know, the State Department calls me because Vietnam is on this bad list. And they want to get off that bad list. And they have this little delegation that's going to go start working with Vietnam in the early 2000s. So they call me, ask me to be a part of the delegation. I said, I can't do that. They said, well, why? We thought you worked in Vietnam and you liked it. I do. But if I start dealing with human rights, they'll kick me out and I can't come back. And I'm not there because I agree with their human rights. I'm there because I love the Vietnamese people. 
And, and it, it became very complicated. You got to understand, I'm a Baptist from Texas, and I'm not working with the Christians. I'm working with the communists. That's problematic. You know, I mean, in Texas, and Baptists and communism don't mix. I mean, we write brochures how to accept Jesus, reject communism. I mean, that's the core of the gospel. Amen? I mean, I've got it so mixed in with my politics. I got to get all this stuff disenculturated. And so I hang up the phone, tell the guy, no, I can't do it. And three minutes later, the ambassador from the United Nations from Vietnam calls me. His son was one that we worked with. He calls me, he says, Bob, why did you tell your State Department no? I said, Your Excellency, how did you know that? He said, We gave him your name. You're the only evangelical we know. You like us. We want at least one person who likes us and understands us to be there. And so I say, Your Excellency, you and I both know if we disagree, you're not letting me back in the country. I'm there because I love you, not because of, I agree with your human rights. And his next response was, Bob, you don't know us like you think you do. You've helped our kids. If you disagree, you disagree. But you care about us. We want you to do it. And so I did. And so I got to help change laws. I don't know nothing about law, but I have friends who do. I got to help get people out of jail. I got to come up with a system where churches can get registered so they have the same freedoms that other Vietnamese do. It changed everything. And I'm not going to talk about this other than to say this and use your imagination. All those people in those positions of authority, there are Nicodemuses all over the world. And sometimes those laws are changing because somebody found Jesus. Somebody found Jesus. I told a very prominent man one day, he signed all the degrees to put people in jail who were Christians. He was my friend. How can you be friends with that guy? I don't know. God orchestrated it. God didn't ask my permission. I went and got him a very nice, expensive Mont Blanc pen. I gave it to him. He was so proud of it. He said, thank you, Bob. I said, your excellency, I want you to use this pen when you sign your legal decrees. And when some Christian or somebody of another religion is fixing to be put in jail for their faith, if you're going to do it, I want you to use this pen and I want you to write your name and think, I'm breaking Bob's heart right now. <laughs> I will say they don't have as many in jail as they used to. Some of them are still there. Are you with me? I haven't had sleep in the last day and a half. I'm going too slow. I'm very sorry. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about domains. What is a domain? A domain is the infrastructure of society. Put it up on the board. Come on, show me on my cl yeah, clip. Now, if you notice on domains, uh, I can't read it real good. I'm going to get over here where I can see it a little bit better. So society is made up of domains, agriculture. And by the way, you can have the three classic, uh, which is economics, governance, and uh, something else. Or you can be World Vision and have 27. Or you could have the eight. That's a human resource map. Look at those. Now, Lauren Cunningham became a very close friend of mine. And Lauren used spheres in seven mountains. All right? I just started reading these guys at Harvard about how cities are put together. And I begin to realize that's how it works. What's missing up there? Come on, somebody who's smart. What's missing up there? What? Oh, it's everywhere. See, that's what we do. We want to add a ninth one, church. And that's why we have culture wars. And that's why we get into dominion theology where we get mean and try to take everything over in the name of Jesus because it's wrong. <laughs> and then we don't wonder why they don't like us. You should have enjoyed that bashing. You were wrong. We were right. 
Church is present in every one of those domains as disciples are present. So church is everywhere. But what we want to do, we want to separate it. Oh, by the way, that little religious freedom thing connected me with all these lawyers that I work with now that work with this all over the world. And it's enabled me to have conversations because I'm friends with people, not because they want to change their laws. But when they need help and they call you or you're in other relationship, it changes everything. And so whether it's businessmen or whatever, and so what we did at Northwood, we inventoried our church. What are your jobs? Here's what most churches do. They have a few projects that they do. And those projects, everybody get involved in those three or four projects. If you understand this, it changes the whole of missiology. We work in Afghanistan. We, do, we have worked in one other place. And I grew up my beard real big, and I went to the governor's house. This was four months after everything went down at 9-11. Went across the Pakistani desert with some mercenaries. And so we get to that knock on his door. And here's how I literally introduce myself. My name is Bob Roberts. I'm a Baptist pastor from Texas. I'm not going to start churches, pass out tracts, do religious work. I'm going to bring my members and my friends if you want us, and we're going to work in these areas. But, but Governor, you need to understand, if somebody asks us about our faith, we have to tell them. To not do so is to reject my faith. And so if you don't want us, it's okay. He looked at me and he started laughing. You know what he said? He said, your missionaries come here and say they're business people. They don't do either job very good. Thank you for being honest with me. I can work with you. I wish I could tell you the story of Afghanistan. I, I don't have time. That's why I'm so deep in the Muslim world. Not because they downloaded my sermons, but because we built orphanages, because we built a community college, because we built community centers, because we built elementary schools, and we did it with imams and pastors. See, I was... Let's show up as Christians. We're going to do our thing, right? We have separated ourselves from being salt and light. I used to look at imams and other religious leaders as gatekeepers that I had to work with in order to get to where I needed to go. And one day I was reading Acts where it said a great number of priests came to faith in Christ and the church grew. And I began to realize, can you imagine what would happen if an imam or a rabbi or a priest or something else accepted Christ? God is undoing all the stuff that I learned. And I'll never forget the first time I saw an imam accept Christ. I was stunned. I thought I didn't explain it right. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, a minute. let me go back. No, I want to. Yeah, but I mean, you understand. Here's what we believe. I, I do. A Catholic priest had given him a Bible 10 years earlier, and he'd been reading it, waiting for someone to explain it. He said, I'm convinced Jesus is not just the son of Mary. He is the son of God. I thought, oh, my gosh, we're both going to die today. Let's get on our knees. Here we go. Missions is a story. That grid up there, God created. It's how all societies, how all structures work. And when that happens, we go in and we reconcile them. We reconcile the people and we reconcile the structures. We restore the structures. It's not about changing the rules. It's about transformation. And so when we do that, it changes everything. I've gone five minutes over. I need to stop and finish this tomorrow and talk a lot faster. <laughs> this is a three-day thing I do. I'm very sorry. But there's about four things when you work in domains that are critical. I want to list them to you real quick. And then we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow. Number one from needs to assets. 
Don't ever ask somebody what they need. Offer them what you've got. And I've got school teachers, and I've got doctors, and I've got business people, and I've got all kind of stuff. The moment you offer what do you need, you're then obliged to fulfill that need or you have no credibility. But when you offer what you've got, it changes everything. It's from programs to domain engagement. It's not merely about here's our program and what we do. It's here's how we're going to do this. It's from working for the city, doing stuff to them, to working with the city, not just your Christian stuff. It's from managing projects to mobilizing your members. And so we've had... About 4,000 people go to Vietnam over the, since 98, spent $8 million, 150 projects, and we've had tons of people accept Christ. And we took that and we did it in Afghanistan and it works. And here's what we do. I believe God's got a global church and I know y'all believe that at New Frontiers. I was just with them. So my goal is I don't want global net churches around the world. I find ethnic leaders in those countries that already have churches. And that's what we hand them off to. And it makes a big difference in the world. And so just hang with me. Let me just share one last thing because I think this might be interesting. So all that religious freedom stuff and all that Muslim stuff. So a few years ago, Muslims realized it's not right how they treat Christians and other religious minorities and Muslim majority nations. So because I was friends with Muslims, because I worked with the Vietnamese doing that, guess who, I, guess who got called? I did. Bob, would you help us? We're working on our own religious freedom statement based out of the Quran. That's a good thing. Because if they use their authority, then it's not Western authority and Judeo-Christian values that we have. They're using their own source of authority. So they do it. And so I get to be a part of all of that. And many of the changes that you've seen happen in the Muslim world came from that one event. I didn't write it. They wrote it. But they had a 50 of us that were non-Muslims there. One of the guys who helped do that is from Saudi Arabia. He came to our church about a year and a half ago, and we had a profound experience as he talked about how things are beginning to change, and they're excited this. And are you ready for this? So we had this interfaith thing at our church. Well, I don't like the word interfaith. We call it multi-faith because I'm an exclusivist. I believe Jesus is the only way. And by the way, I tell people that publicly when I start. I just tell them, you're all going to hell, everybody. <laughs> Baptist, all of you. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> so, so he saw that. And he said, you know, I need to do that in Saudi Arabia. So last year, the first interfaith gathering in the history of Saudi Arabia. The king had to sign off of it, and crown prince, everybody else. They had it. And guess what I gave those guys, because some of them had heard about Luther. I gave them the stories of our Reformation about Luther and Zwingli and all these guys, some history books, Roger Williams. Y'all kicked him out of England. We took him. We liked him. He's a little nutso, but he was okay. Guys, when you get on that grid map, you won't be able to keep up with the church planting because so many people will be accepting Christ. Here's what's cool. It gets out of control. Let's pray. Father, we love you with all of our being. We want to follow you. We want to obey you. God, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. You call people to be vocational missionaries to live in countries. Thank you for all those out of Northwood and all those out of here that do that. We pray for them. We support them. We have a responsibility to support, give, do whatever we can to help. But God, that has not let us off the hook, the rest of us. Lord, when we understood this, it impacted a nation, then some other nations, and then our own city. Help us to lift our eyes up to see the world in ways 
like we have never seen it before, is my prayer in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.